welcome back to Something to Talk About, a podcast and blog series from Stenhouse Publishers. I'm Cassia Wedekind, and I'm an editor here at Stenhouse, and I'm also a Stenhouse author and a math coach. As you may remember from episode one, here on the Something to Talk About mini podcast, we ask just one juicy question about classroom discourse and hear the unique responses and perspectives of several educators. And in today's episode, we're asking educators about the best piece of advice they've gotten about facilitating classroom conversations. When I first thought about asking this question, I thought about this idea of advice in a pretty traditional way, as something that one teacher would explicitly suggest to another. But not surprisingly, the educators I talked to in this episode had much more interesting ways of thinking about advice and how we learn from one another about classroom conversations. Some learned from the words of their colleagues, but others talked about professional books as mentors in their learning, observing other teachers in action, or even learning from others' observations of their own teaching. Christy Thompson, a literacy coach in Virginia and the co-author of Hands Down Speak Out, joins us first in thinking about the best advice she's gotten about classroom conversations. If I think to when I really started thinking about classroom conversation in a big way, it was because I was reading at the time Peter Johnson's books like Um, choice words um, and opening minds. And I think that he started me on this journey in just thinking about trusting children and trusting what they bring um, to school with them rather than thinking of what we need to do to them or put into them. And I think that that really is at the heart of all classroom conversations that I try to hold. And that's probably the best, most impactful piece of inf- of advice that I've been reflecting on over many years. Yeah, that sounds like a particularly um, important message to take into this year where um, like we're getting so many outside messages about learning loss and making up lost time and kind of fixing things that are wrong with children in quotes um and that we could probably use some further trust in children uh in conversations and beyond in schools matthew k a high school teacher in philadelphia and the author of not light but fire talked about an observation he received from his principal on his stance in classroom conversations My boss, Chris, my first couple years, it wasn't as much advice as it was an observation that um, he said, and then I took it as advice. (laughs) First couple years, I was, you know, archetypical 22-year-old jumping up on table type teacher. Like, I was doing all that kind of stuff. And, like, around the time when I crossed to 30, like around year seven or eight or something like that, right, he walked in and... I was sitting at my desk, but the kids was talking. I was sitting at my desk. <laughs> I was just chilling. And, and he said, um, and I remember he said, like, he noted that. He noted, like, how it became from me centered to them centered and how it be- had, how it turned up. And he was joking about, like, your career is going to be longer <laughs> now. <laughs> like, you're not going to wear yourself out. And, and it's one of those. And I think I took that as advice. Like, I, I, I took that as, like, you know, you don't got to do all that. Like, you don't have to do all that, all that perform. Like, and I'm performative, so I don't have to suppress it either. Like, if I feel like being a fool, then I'm going to be a fool. Like, I I get a chance. But um, I think we're conditioned sometimes to think that the only way to grab kids' attention in a conversation is to be that. And it's not. And I think, you know, and that's partially actually why it came down to the book. Because I'm like, People feel the same thing about race conversations. They're in a space where like, well, I can only lead it if I am this type. And I'm like, no, everybody can. Like, you don't have to be a jokester. You don't have to be the jump on table cut type teacher to do it. You know, my mom taught for 36 years and, you know, because of some health issues, she did most of it sitting down in front of her kids on, on her stool, just sat there. Right. You don't have to do all that. 
Like, you know, you just have to love kids and be very purposeful about your craft. And so I think that was the biggest piece of advice I got. Like, it was just kind of like, he said that observation and I'm like, and I took it as advice. Santasha Dute, a first grade teacher in the Seattle area, shares two practical pieces of advice she's gotten and implemented in her first two years of teaching. I've gotten two pieces of advice that I've taken throughout my couple years of teaching. I think first is the valuing, valuing multiple ways of participating and multiple ways of talk. I think that helps ground me in not feeling really anxious when I have a student not orally sharing, but finding multiple different ways for students to participate. I think that's been my first big like, whoa, that's really true. Because I think as adults, I think we value different ways that we can share. And sometimes it's not always orally or we don't feel the most comfortable with oral talk. So why are we pushing that down on our students? So I think it's been really fun to try and think of different ways for my students to participate, that it's not just producing talk or producing written work. So um, I think that's been my first piece of great advice. And then my second piece of advice that someone gave me was the having students uh, orally practice or orally share in smaller processing groups before sharing to a big group. And I think it seems so small and seems like, yeah, of course, like that makes a lot of sense. But I think in a school day where you're t- like, you're always running out of time, it's just something that can be so easily cut. But I think it makes for so much richer and deeper conversations when we come back to the whole group. And sometimes it's, I might cut the whole group or not do, might not all come back together if we're short on time, but n- not cutting that smaller group processing because it's just so valuable to be able to talk in a smaller group of people and f- um for all of my students, not just my MLLs, but just to be able to orally rehearse um, or just hear other students' ideas before going on to a different task or coming back together as a whole group. And then for myself as a teacher, I think that time, it that think pair share time gives me the chance to be like walking around and hearing from so many more students than. I would be if it was just a whole group conversation. So I think that making sure that I'm not ever cutting that out just reminds me to like slow down and that we all appreciate just going a little bit slower. And that makes the learning so much more meaningful and intentional as well. And math education professors and co-authors of Intentional Talk, Alham Kazemi and Allison Hintz, talk about what they learned from the words and actions of a principal colleague. Alham speaks first. I was thinking of Jessica Granger, Allison, who we both know and adore. She's a a principal that we worked with for a long time, and she um, would always say, you can't look good and get better at the same time. And we're not sure if she made that up or if she got it from somewhere, but that's our mantra. You got to roll up your sleeves and try. That is a good mantra and a painful one at times. (laughs) At first you want to say, sure, I can look good, but you know, the sentiment of it is important, I think. (laughs) It was freeing when she'd say that because it, it helped us remember to be brave and try new things and that we can be clunky together. And um, that's all part of us getting better. Yeah. And being part of a a community of teachers that's getting better together and and being willing to see that clunkiness and be clunky in front of each other as you're working together to get better. Yeah. I think it, it um, worked to interrupt this idea that teaching's a performance and that we were going to know just what to say 
but that our work is to hear children's ideas. And so we might have ideas about what's coming, but we're going to be surprised. And so there's not a perfect script. You're going to do the best you can to try to think together and respond to what they're telling us they do know. I think my best piece of advice didn't happen through spoken words, but it was through observation. And I've learned so much by being in the presence of math educators as they work with young mathematicians. And when I was thinking about this question, I was really thinking about what it feels like to observe Megan, Frankie, or Elham, you, um, as you listen with curiosity to children's ideas and the joy that you find in the brilliance that children and their families bring to our communities. And it's been such helpful observation um, because it's free to believe that our work is just to hear children's brilliance and to keep asking questions to uncover what they do understand. And watching you live into that, I think has freed me to believe that instead of worrying that I needed to know what I was going to say or say the perfect thing or understand the mathematics myself, um, that I could set those worries aside and just head into discussions with a lot of curiosity and know that students are going to surprise me today and I can't wait to find out what they tell me. Listening to our guests in this episode reminded me of a piece of advice about classroom conversations that I learned in my first few years of teaching and that I still remember and use many years later. Um, it was my first year at a new school, the wonderful Bailey's Elementary School in Fairfax County, Virginia, and I had a math coach for the very first time. Her name was Jessica Shumway, and some of you may know her from her Number Sense Routines books. And it was September and I really did not know a whole lot about teaching math yet. And I remember I was sitting with Jessica in my second grade classroom and I was watching her work with a small group of students on a story problem. And several students had already shared their strategies for the problem, which they had all solved correctly. But there was one student, Emmy, who was convinced the answer was something else. She was wrong, but she had a really interesting strategy that did make a lot of sense. And it was the first time that I really got to see another teacher ha handle a wrong answer in math. Jessica listened closely to Emmy and helped the other students engage with her idea. And at the end of the small group time, we still hadn't gotten to a resolution. And I remember that Jessica said with kind of a proud smile, Emmy still isn't convinced. We're going to have to think about this some more. And what I learned from that experience is that not every conversation needs to come to a neat resolution. That's not how classroom talk works and that's not how learning works. Understanding happens over many conversations, many learning experiences, and we can be okay with and celebrate it thinking in progress and students who are skeptical and really demand to make sense of something themselves rather than being convinced because a teacher tells us or because a peer tells us that something is the right answer. This moment watching Jessica teach passed by in just a moment, but it's something that I remember now 15 years later. And I still use that turn of phrase, it sounds like you're not convinced yet. So we're wondering, what is the best piece of advice about classroom conversations that you've gotten? Did it come from something a colleague said or from watching another teacher at work, or maybe it came from a favorite professional book? We'd love to hear from you on our Stenhouse blog, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we'll see you back here in a couple of weeks for another mini podcast episode of Something to Talk About. <laughs>